Gary Leland, welcome to the Bitcoin Source. Happy to have you. Can we start things off by introducing yourself? Sure, sure. Happy to be on the show. I'm glad you asked me to come on. Yeah, I'm Gary Leland. I'm uh, known as the Bitcoin Boomer. Um, I run the Bitblock Boom Bitcoin Conference that's uh, out of Austin, Texas now. This will be our sixth year coming up in 2023. I'm pretty much a Bitcoiner, not a shitcoiner. And um, that's it. Just a 67-year-old guy that's uh, living the dream. 100%. Gary, so the first question I usually ask people on the show is, where did they source their Bitcoin knowledge from, whether it be books, courses, or even people in the ecosystem that you've met over the years? So could you kind of break down to the audience, you know, how you kind of came about sourcing your Bitcoin knowledge? Yeah, I'm uh, most of my Bitcoin knowledge started with the podcast, listening to podcasts. That was an early podcaster. I started podcasting in 2004. Probably put me like one of the first hundred podcasters on the planet. So I've been listening to podcasts for years and years and years. I got into Bitcoin in early 2017. So actually, probably within hours of having Bitcoin explained to me on the way home from uh, a conference I was speaking at, at the conference, someone explained Bitcoin to me. So on the way home, I searched Bitcoin and started listening to Bitcoin podcasts within half an hour finding out about Bitcoin and have been listening to Bitcoin podcast ever since. Early was Bitcoin podcast, or crypto podcast, I'd say mostly. And then over time, it's become books. And then I started the uh, the the video shows, my video shows, so I could interview people. I actually created, my first one was a Crypto Cousins show. And I created it so I could bring on guests and actually ask them the questions I had. I found out in the early days of podcasting, if you had brought someone on the interview, they would come on and talk to you forever. Or if you said, hey, can I call you up and ask you some questions, they, they would never answer your questions. So it gives you, doing an interview show like this, for instance, gives you a chance to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with some of the, the bigger minds in, in the field that you're trying to learn about. And that's what I did was listen to podcasts, did interviews with people. And, uh, and I asked them the questions I want to know. I figure if I find it interesting or I want to know it, someone else probably wants to know it. So there's really no better way of learning about something than asking questions to experts, you know, uh, in the field. So that, I would say that was my learning source and still is pretty much. Yeah, I, I have to agree with that. You know, I always find it very insightful to learn from people that have more experience, more knowledge in the space than myself. And my second question kind of kind of goes into this even in more in depth, which is, in your opinion, you know, what is some of the biggest obstacles that the boomer generation has understanding Bitcoin? Well, I think the boomer generation starts at a um, in the hole because they are not as computer literate as a whole. I'm not saying everybody. I mean, I mean, I consider myself pretty computer literate, but I have friends that uh, talk like, "Oh, I check my email once a month, even if I don't need to." You know, so <laughs> I'm like, oh, "Well, the email world is left. We're not using that anymore." Um, you know, like we used to. But a lot of boomers don't use computers. Like they didn't grow up with computers, I guess, and so that's a detriment to them. Now everybody has a phone. So everybody does have a computer in their hands. But if you're like my wife, for instance, you use your computer in your hand just to look at Facebook and check your emails. <laughs> you know, so uh, that's about the extent. I don't know if she really does. Oh, she does pay her bills with her, with her phone. But that's about the extent of it. She still writes down her schedule on a big giant calendar on the wall. You know, so boomers just didn't grow up like i said they didn't grow up with technology so it's a, it's a little more of a gap for them you know they can't even get their passwords down <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah and you know and like my mom for example she's the youngest of the boomer generation so me trying to orange pill her and tell her about bitcoin it was a little bit easier because she's a little bit more tech savvy but I definitely agree with what you're saying there, Gary, where like she kind of was confused on a lot of the concepts and she just couldn't understand. I think boomers, a lot of times, if it's not tangible and they can't physically see it in front of them, it's hard for them to comprehend this digital asset that's kind of going to change the world. Like they, it's hard for them to kind of decipher if it's real or if it's not. So 
I've had quite the job trying to like orange pill my mom and I'm still trying to, to this day, but she's come a long way. And if, and if you tell them it's the internet protocol, they don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> they have no idea what that could possibly mean. So yeah, you're right though. It's uh, if your mom's at the lower end, at least she grew up with uh, computers or got into computers early, let's say um, where I didn't get my first computer until 83. I got the first Macs that came out or the first Mac that came out, I guess. Um, so yeah, it makes a big difference. Uh, cause you know, we all learn easier when we're young, the older you get, the more set in your ways. And that replies to what you just said is not tangible. People of my age want to feel like they need to, I, I, this, and this is a weird, this is kind of like an oxymoron. They feel like they have to owe, hold their money, but they don't hold any money hardly at all. I mean, but they feel like they need to be able to just to, to that it's possible to do. Not that they're going to do it. It's not like they're like holding all their money. They're using credit cards. Uh, they're doing bank transfers, but they're not really walking around with thousands of dollars in their pockets. But they feel like they need to be able to hold thousands of dollars in their pockets if they want to for some unknown reason. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. And um, Gary, you know, you've done so much in the space and I know a lot of people know about you. And one of my favorite conferences is Bit Block Boom. So could you kind of explain to the audience like what inspired you to create that conference? Well, it was the same thing. Um, I'm one of those people that I just do stuff when I want to find out, learn stuff. So I started, I got into Bitcoin in 2017 and by 2018, I did Bitblock Boom. So I don't even know if I'd been into it a year when I started planning Bitblock Boom. And there was another opportunity to meet firsthand people that were Bitcoiners. And actually, yeah, I really just tried to create the kind of conference I would want to go to with speakers that, uh, you know, to talk about Bitcoin, you know, basically, because that's all I'm interested in. And it turns out there's a lot of other people that are interested in Bitcoin. But I, I think I've created an environment, though, where people can go that have been in Bitcoin a long time and feel like they're with their peers, maybe. Um, you know, I, I really don't know if it's as much a beginner conference. It's not a place you would go if you wanted to learn about Bitcoin. I think if someone paid to come to my conference because they didn't know what Bitcoin was and they wanted to know what Bitcoin was, they may be unhappy with what they got um, because we don't go over the basic fundamentals of what is Bitcoin. It's a little more advanced. And that's for people who've been into Bitcoin a while and they not only want to talk about things that uh, Bitcoin influences or uh, the world of Bitcoin in general, but they also want to hang out with their peers and meet people who pretty much know about as much about Bitcoin as they do, I guess I would say, instead of someone who's going, hey, should I get a treasure wallet or should I get a, you know, a, a wallet on my phone? What kind of wallet I get? That's not the, the typical person that should be coming to Bitblock Boom, and I never try to talk that person into coming to Bitblock Boom. Like I said, I, I think it's because we have a more advanced and, and we're pretty strict on who can, like vendors, for instance, like we had a vendor this year, we gave them back their $10,000 sponsorship because um, I didn't feel that they were being good to the Bitcoin community. We've turned down numerous sponsors before um, because they weren't Bitcoiny enough. I don't know if that's a word, Bitcoiny, but I'm going to use it in this phrase. So. We try to stick to our core. You know, there may be a little slippage here and there, but no one can display anything, um, you know, that is not Bitcoin related. Well, I want to say not Bitcoin related, but, you know, for instance, we had a vendor two years ago that was a real estate company that wanted to sponsor the bags because they want people to spend Bitcoin with them. That wasn't a Bitcoin company, but it wasn't a shitcoin company, you know, or an NFT company or something like that. So we kind of tr try to stay on track. I think people appreciate that. I don't think someone who's a really strong Bitcoiner wants someone trying to tell them why XRP is a really good value, you know, because no matter how much that guy tells him and talks to him for five days, he's not going to change his mind and start buying XRP. You know, so I, I think people, there's a lot of people who 
appreciate the fact that they're around like mine, like minds, maybe. Yeah, and I definitely appreciate it. And, you know, one thing about your conference, Gary, is once I realized that, you know, you start handing out those Faraday bags, I was like, okay, this is the real deal. Like this isn't, you know, a lot of people don't even know what those are or what the purpose for those are. But like when you're a real Bitcoiner and you understand security and self-custody, you know, getting something like that, it's like, oh, this guy gets it. Like, I love this conference. So thank yeah. you, Gary, for kind of bringing that conference to the world. It's huge. I keep not only my wallet and those, but my backup phone that I have for emergency. And that, you know, this year we gave out copies of um, the book uh, Bitcoin and the American Dream to everybody. So everybody came in and got a copy of that book. Um, so I thought that was a good way to spread the word. I think most everybody at Bitblock Boom. I'm not going to say everybody, but I think the majority of people at BitBlock Boom know the contents of that book without reading it. You know, they're not going to they're not going to go in that book and go, oh, my gosh, I didn't know this about Bitcoin. You know, so it's a tool that though we've given them that they can share with someone. So I think more of those books will be shared with people uh, and to help them learn about Bitcoin. Yeah, most definitely. And uh, Gary, you know what's interesting? I remember you mentioning earlier in the interview that you know you're a more seasoned individual. You're a boomer. You're in your sixties. I'm old. And <laughs> yeah, and I remember you talking to CK on Bitcoin Magazine in one of your interviews before. And my question to you that I always found profound that I wanted to ask you was: Do you feel like retirees should invest their Social Security into Bitcoin? Yeah, I do. As a matter of fact, uh, I feel that, um, you know, I, I sold my businesses last July so I could focus strictly on Bitcoin. But um, before I sold my business, I, I was I turned 66 in two months where I could start getting social. Well, I guess you can get it earlier, but like you can get full social security or I could at 66 years in two months and um, without being penalized for making income. Um, before that, I guess I'd be penalized if I made money. I was going to wait till I was 70 to start taking my Social Security because I didn't need it because um, I'm still bringing in an income. And I figured it would be more of it. And then I was in Miami uh, down there just on vacation. I had a luncheon with Bitcoin Tina and Katie the Russian was there and several people were there. And I can't remember who one of the individuals were, but they, you know, with the exception of Katie the Russian, we all were old farts. And uh, one of them goes, we were talking about Social Security. I guess that's what old people do. Social Security and Medicare, because they're such great deals. Um, once you get them, that is, they're great. They're not great when you're young. But once you get them, they're great. And I, and I said, told someone I was going to wait till I was 70. And he said, what are you waiting for? You should go ahead and start taking it and throwing that in the Bitcoin. And I was like, oh, you're right. I should just start buying, <laughs> getting it every month now. Even though I could get more when I'm 70, I don't know how much more I would get and just put it into Bitcoin instead of waiting and letting the government keep my money for five more years so they could give me a little more. It's probably by the time we, they gave it to me with all the inflation, it'd be worth the same damn amount with spending power. So I am one of those people that, you know, I'm a pretty much strong believer in Bitcoin and I, I'm pretty heavy in Bitcoin and I go heavy in Bitcoin. I, I don't know that that's the right advice for everybody. You know, if they're living off their Social Security, that would be a whole different situation than someone who's just getting it because it's just extra money coming out of the blue. And that's a weird way to say it, but it truly is. So, And I, I try to be, you know, when I talk to people, straight up with them how things are. Um, so for someone like me, while that may be a good strategy, I don't know if it's a good strategy for someone who's living on, Bitcoin, on uh, Social Security or depending on it heavily, but I do think there's no time that's a bad time to throw a small amount of your income into Bitcoin. I mean, if uh, whether it's, I'm going to go to the bottom, whether it's $5 a week or $100 a week or 1000 a week, there's no bad time to buy Bitcoin. I don't think there's been any time over a two-year period that people are down on Bitcoin. Uh, and with the inflation that we're seeing now that we've never seen before, well, I don't know, maybe we saw higher when I was a young kid in the 70s. But it's pretty damn high. It's the highest it's been in 40 years. So I think now may be even more prudent to put some of your money into Bitcoin, um, even if it's a small amount. I don't think you can go wrong personally. I think Bitcoin's going to change the world. I truly do. And I think we're getting closer and closer to that all the time. I know, I would think, you know, I just got back from 
Paris. We went over there for a week, and last time I was there, a dollar it took a, a dollar fifty approximately to buy a euro. Now it took a dollar to buy a euro. Those guys have gotten hit pretty bad. I bet a lot of them wish they were throwing their money into Bitcoin, even though Bitcoin's down. It's still, you know, going to come back up and is holding its own. So, yeah. In short, I'm sorry, I talk a long time, but in short, to your question, yes, I think everybody should be buying Bitcoin. Yeah, most definitely. And I mean, like you're saying, when you just went to France, the British pound right now, they're getting slammed. And, you know, the power well, that be there against the dollar. Yep, exactly. And it's like, think about all the people that are older in that generation that live in Britain, live in London, and they've worked their whole lives to save money and to just see, you know, whether we're way in front of them is kind of like one of those things where it's like, man, like imagine if they knew about Bitcoin. So I'm so glad, Gary, that you kind of like really gave that to the audience because I think a lot of people that are older, they really don't know what to do with their retirement or if they do do things with their retirement it may not be putting it into sound money like something like bitcoin so that would be super helpful and i'm glad that you kind of broke that down so thank and you i for think that. right and i think right now with the market the way it is the, <laughs> the market's almost dropped as much as bitcoin has i mean you know and it's not a volatile market right <laughs> like bitcoin's a volatile market so with the way the market is i'm afraid some people are not saving anything you know and they're saying with the rate of inflation, with the markets doing it like it is, I need to go out and spend my money today before it's worth less tomorrow, um, which I don't know. A lot of people, when they get my age, we've got, you know, by the time you're 67, you've got a lot of the things you need and you're not really buying stuff anymore. You've got a refrigerator that works or you got a washer and dryer that works or you got a car that, you, that works, you know, and you don't plan on doing another one. But they're just they're spending their money, though, I, I'm afraid, and they need to. I don't know. I'm a big proponent into dollar cost averaging. I really am. And if you don't have a lot of extra money that you can afford to put away, if you are one of those people that are going, you know, Gary, I, I want it. That tells me I want to put some away, but I only, I, I need everything I have. You know, my big thing is quit drinking beer, quit smoking cigarettes, quit doing whatever you're doing and start spending that money on Bitcoin and just have it taken out your check every week. Or not your check, but have a dollar cost average out of your account every week, whether it's five dollars or ten dollars. I don't care what service you use. I don't care if you use Cash App, I don't care if you use Swan, I don't care if you use what. But you should start doing that. And and now it's a pretty good time to do it. We've seen it come off all time highs of sixty, seventy thousand dollars. So it's a good time to start dollar cost averaging. And I think that you'd be pleasantly surprised. Yeah, I find people who are at least raising boomers. I find that people I can talk to them till the cows come home and they may not buy any Bitcoin. And I can even talk them into buying Bitcoin, but they don't ever buy any more as soon as they buy that and they don't even keep up with it. But if I can get them to buy a much smaller amount than a one time purchase of a decent amount, if I can get them to buy a smaller amount on a regular basis, I've found the odds of them getting orange pilled grow drastically i mean you know i mean it's just they 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 keep seeing in their uh email that they bought some bitcoin uh many places now send emails educational emails out you know and they have some skin in the game and once they have some skin in the game that's the deal once they get some skin in the game and they get that constant reminder even though it's not a lot they start learning and paying more attention and next thing you know bam they go and make a purchase. And they go, okay, I got it. I need to buy some of this. And then and they go and buy it, even though, you know, I had a friend, 2017, I talked to him to buy $3,000 worth of Bitcoin. He bought it, never looked at it again. Bought it on Coinbase and never looked at it again. Then in 2021, maybe, uh, when it was rising up to 20000 I, I was talking to him and I said, or 70000 I mean, when it was rising to 70000 I talked to him and said, hey, I'm not trying to be pushy here, but I kind of feel like you're like one of my good friends that I want to make sure that I owe it to you to make sure that you know and aware of what's happening in Bitcoin. And he goes, yeah, I bought that Bitcoin from you. And I said, and he goes, I've never looked at it ever since. And I said, okay. And he said, hold on. And he went on and goes, oh my gosh, that's gone up a lot. And I said, yeah, that's what I'm trying to tell you. So I told him to start dollar cost averaging. And after a couple of weeks, he called me up and goes, hey, I just bought $10,000 worth of Bitcoin. I said, hey, I told you just to buy like $100 a week. He goes, I know, but I kind of got it now, I think. So I wanted to go ahead and start purchasing it. 
So the uh, the the dollar cost averaging, if if you really believe you're doing someone a favor by getting them into Bitcoin, by dollar cost averaging, not only are you helping them put their money into Bitcoin, but you're going to end up educating them, and they aren't going to need your help anymore for Bitcoin because they're going to learn it on their own. So dollar cost averaging is a stronger tool than people give it credit for because most people just give it credit for being a way of savings, but they don't realize the amount of education that people get if they start dollar cost averaging. And that's the real key is the educational tool of dollar cost averaging by having skin in the game. Well, you know, no one, I think, well, I'm not going to say no one, but the majority of people do not buy Bitcoin and go, oh my gosh, this is the best time in the world to buy Bitcoin. You know, the people who bought Bitcoin at $100 said, oh, we've missed a boat. It was a dollar. But let's give it a try. And the people who bought it at $1,000 said, oh, we missed the boat. It was 100 But let's give it a try. And the people who bought it $3,000 said that and 10000 You know what I mean? They, they've always said that, oh, I'm kind of late to the game. No one said, oh, I'm super early to the game. You know, even the people who were buying at 50 cents were going, I don't know if this is going to work or not. So... Um, it's not like there's a, a late time to get into Bitcoin, for sure. You're, you're right. And people are going to start looking at this in the past. And when I got into Bitcoin, I was like, ah, my wife was giving me a hard time buying that ma fake made up Internet money. I said, no, no, I think this is something. Yeah, but it's at the top of the price. This is the highest it's ever been. I said, I know, but I think it's going to be a good value. So there's this there's, there's net the fact that it's. You haven't missed the boat, I guess, is what I said. And that's what a lot of people are thinking. They think they've missed the boat. And they definitely haven't. You know, most of the time, I'm going to just give an example. Like in 2017, you know, at around um, Thanksgiving of 2017, I think, big, and I could be wrong on this, but I'm just using memory here. And, and, and we all know I'm 67, so we know how shot that probably is. But I think around Thanksgiving, Bitcoin was around $3,000, dollars $4,000. By Christmas, it was $19,000 approximately. You know, and then we had um, this run up to 60, 70, what was it, like 67000 or something. You know, it was $20,000. And then three months later, it was $60,000, $70,000. So when Bitcoin moves, it moves fast. You know what I mean? It goes sideways for a while. I remember my wife's just going, I hate this stuff. How long is it going to be staying the same price? It's been the same price forever. And then, bam, shot up to $67,000, $70,000. So when Bitcoin moves, it moves. And it's probably in the bull run, probably if you took out the top 20 days, you probably wouldn't have made anything because most of the money was made in the top 20 days. You know, so... Um, I don't even know where I'm coming up with that, but I, 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 this stuff I remember. Yeah, most definitely. And Gary, you know, this, this conversation has been great. I love it. You know, I hope people really got a real good insight, especially people that are from the older generation. Hopefully they can really look at this and say like, wow, like this is something that I could really dig into. And if I have, you know, questions, I can find answers from people like yourself, from myself and from other people in the space. So Gary, could you give people your social media handles and anything sure. else that you have in the future? Sure. Yeah. I'm just, yeah. I'm just uh, Gary Leland most everywhere. Um, I think someone got my handle on Instagram before I did, but about everywhere else, I'm Gary Leland. And uh, I also do Bitcoins for Boomers show at BitcoinforBoomers.com. So, um, and then Bitblock Boom. But uh, you can find everything I do at Gary Leland. You can track me down anywhere. And I'm open. All my, all my stuff's open for DMs. Most definitely. Once again, Gary Leland, thank you for taking time to be on the Bitcoin source. Have a good one. Yeah, I appreciate your time. Thanks for having me on.